Yeah, sorry. I I just did that too. I think everybody keeps themselves on mute on accident. Um, I'm going to give folks just a few more seconds to kind of filter in and then we'll get started since I realize it's a few minutes after the hour. So thank you all for your patience. Um, by way of background, I'm Chelsea Hackett. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the outreach coordinator in the JD admissions office. And you are all attending an information session about the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, or CLE as we call it for short at Berkeley Law. Um, I'm really here just to help facilitate this session. So um, as you may have heard when you entered, this session is being recorded. So if you miss anything, you know, don't worry about it. We'll be posting this on the website after the fact. Um, we also have the Q&A function enabled. And so if you have any questions either during the session or towards the end of the session, you're welcome to type in those questions in the Q&A and um, the folks over at CLE will be monitoring that and, and helping to answer those questions. Um, but with that, that's really the only ground rules that I have and I'll turn it over to Ethan Elkind from CLE. All right, thank you so much, Chelsea. And I just wanna welcome all of you to, uh, to the webinar. And hopefully this will answer questions that you have, certainly about the Center for Law, Energy and the Environment, or CLE, as uh, Chelsea noted as our acronym. Uh, but we'll also talk a bit about uh, the law school's environmental and energy offerings uh, more generally. So you have a sense of all that there is going on at uh, Berkeley Law uh, in terms of environment uh, and, and energy programming. Uh, so first of all, just some housekeeping uh, details around uh, this panel. So I'll provide a, a little bit of an overview over the kind of whole ecosystem, no pun intended, of uh, the environmental energy programming at CLE and the law school more generally. Uh, I'll hand it over then to uh, Professor Dan Farber, who's going to give an overview of the curriculum offerings, uh, including our clinic program and certificate programs. Uh, I'll give an overview of, about CLE and how our research fits into the overall law school environment, as well as our student engagement uh, opportunities. And then we have uh, Arida joining us who can discuss some of the student-led activities and organizations, uh, both specific to environmental and energy law uh, and also intersectional ones as well. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end of this. So uh, definitely be thinking of questions. You can use the Q&A function uh, to put any questions in, into that. And, and if, as they come up, if they're relevant to what we're saying in the moment, then we'll try to address them in that moment. But otherwise, we'll definitely uh, set aside as much time at the end as we can. We hope about 30 minutes uh, to answer any questions that you have. So first of all, just in terms of a, a broad overview of uh, the components of our environmental and energy uh, program at, uh, at Berkeley Law, there's basically Kind of four pillars uh, you could think of in, in that way of our, our uh, program here. So first of all, there's the curriculum, all the energy uh, and environmental law course offerings that we have at the law school. Uh, then of course, there's the center, the Center for Law, Energy and the Environment, where I'm, I normally direct the climate program. I think I still do that, but as of this week, I'm now the interim executive director because we're in the midst of a, of a transition. Our uh, former executive director is going off to head the Environmental Law Institute in, in Washington, DC, which we're all sad about, but I'm stepping in temporarily to cover some of those duties. But we're really the research arm and the research center uh, for the environmental and energy law program. And we have a program that covers water, uh, climate, uh, energy, land use, uh, and oceans as well. Uh, and there are opportunities for student engagement, which I'll discuss in a bit. Uh, and then the third pillar is our clinical program, which is part of our curriculum, but really functions in its own way as a really hands-on practical way to get uh, environmental and energy law experience, working with clients out in the field under the supervision of faculty. Uh, and then finally, all the different student-led activities and organizations that uh, Arida can talk a bit more about. Uh, so those are the basic pillars there. And with that, I want to hand it over to Professor Dan Farber, who leads our energy and environmental law curriculum programming. He's a real luminary in the field and one of the real highlights for, uh, for us at CLE being at, at Berkeley is being able to work with Dan and benefit from all of his uh, amazing scholarship and, and diverse interest areas across environmental energy law. And I'll just say one last thing about Professor Farber and about our program in general, which is that we do have a blog legalplanet.org uh, and Professor Farber is a prolific blogger on there but if you want to get uh, some of the latest on his interests and thinking you can check out that blog and subscribe uh, and also get more information in general about uh, environmental and energy topics. So with that I'll hand it over to Professor Farber. Um, took me a minute to remember to unmute. Uh, thanks Ethan for that uh, introduction. 
Um, and uh, I should say that the blog is not just all me. Um, and Ethan and others also contribute uh, very uh, informative blog posts on everything from affordable housing in California to the uh, Glasgow uh, International Climate uh, Conference to uh, renewable energy issues in California. Um, I was trying to think about what would be useful to say. You can find lists of our courses online. And so I don't want to just go through all the courses, uh, besides which there are quite a few of them. Uh, so what I'd like to do is give you a quick tour and try to bring a little bit of order uh, to what uh, I think can seem like uh, just a, a, a very diverse and complicated uh, curriculum. Um, and one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons we offer so many environmental law courses is that the field is too um, big for one size to fit all. Uh, we uh, offer a lot of different courses so that people can find the ones that fit their interests best. Um, and we also offer two different uh, certificates to law students, one in environmental law and the other one in energy law. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do is talk about some of our cross-cutting courses uh, that uh, really are, are useful no matter what your specific interest is. Uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the specific focus areas that some people might have. Um, and then if there's time, maybe say a little bit about other aspects of our uh, program uh, for students that are outside the uh, curriculum itself. Uh, I, don't, I, I wanna leave plenty of time for Q&A and I know we have other speakers too, so I'm not sure if I'll get to the last part. So in terms of cross-cutting courses, uh, I would identify, I don't know, five, I guess, four rather, uh, as being courses that would be good fits no matter what your specific interest is within environmental law. Uh, one of them is the um, Introduction to Environmental Law and Policy. It's a very broad scale course that covers everything from environmental impact statements, to uh, toxic substances, to uh, air pollution, water pollution, and climate change. Uh, the climate change uh, law class is also very broad because climate change intersects with a lot of other issues. Environmental justice is a concern that cuts all the way across the field of environmental law. And international environmental law deals with pretty much the whole array of environmental issues. Um, I would also include in the cross-cutting category, the environmental law clinic, which does work on a variety of different environmental issues. The field placements we offer where you can go work for the Sierra Club or uh, other organizations or government agencies for credit um, and various other experiential options and opportunities to do writing and research about environmental issues. So in terms of focus areas, um, I think I would see three of those, uh, although I think other people might cut the pie up a little bit differently. So one set of issues involves land and resource issues. Um, and courses here could include environmental transaction law, which is about the environmental issues that come up when you're buying or selling companies or buying and selling land, uh, public lands and natural resource law, which is about the one third of the US that's owned by the federal government, uh, and which also has a, a high percentage of oil and gas, mineral resources, uh, uh, logging, et cetera, all of which raise big environmental problems. And biodiversity law, which is really important uh, in terms of uh, those issues outside of what is traditionally considered to be environmental law, I would also include the land use course uh, because issues about urban sprawl um, are really uh, increasingly important in thinking about air pollution and climate change problems. Um, so that they have a strong environmental aspect, even though some of the legal rules are about things like zoning that aren't directly environmental. A second area uh, is climate and energy. Uh, so here, some of the courses would include the climate change law course, 
uh, a new course we're offering this semester called Pathways to Carbon Neutrality, uh, which is mostly about the um, plans both in, in, in two very different places, California and China, uh, to uh, uh, cut emissions uh, in time to meet the uh, climate targets uh, that uh, have been set in both places. Uh, the introductory course, of course, on an, um, an introductory course on energy law and policy. Energy law is another course that used to be considered very different than environmental law, but now the two of them are really tightly connected. Um, we have also a more advanced course on renewable energy uh, and an energy project finance course because having great regulations only gets you so far if you can't get the money to build those solar farms and windmills and transmission lines. And then the third area I would point to is water and oceans. Uh, water law, which is about fresh water, basically, uh, about um, who gets how much water and about how clean it has to be. Biodiversity law, because there are a lot of, there's a lot of biodiversity in rivers, lakes, and the ocean, and the course on ocean and coastal areas. So those are some of the more specialized uh, directions that you could take. You don't have to pick one of these three topics and stick to it. These are not like you know majors within the you know a department or something like that. Many students take courses in all three of these focus areas, but some people have a specific interest in, in public lands, maybe, or in um, oceans, or uh, in climate change, and they may want to pursue that. And let me just briefly mention the other uh, points I was going to talk about without going into any detail, because I, I do want to make sure we have plenty of time for uh, every, all, all the speakers and then for Q&A. So I mentioned the uh, certificates uh, that we offer in environment and energy law. Uh, I think those are important for students because they're a way to demonstrate to future employers uh, that they're committed to environmental law and that they've got a really solid background. And that's true whether the employers are private, you know, law firms or organizations like Sierra Club uh, or um, government. Uh, and the certificates are also a sign of our school's commitment to the areas because, you know, we pretty much have to guarantee that all the courses required for the certificate will always be there for you. Um, another uh, thing I wanted to mention, courses outside the law school. Uh, one of the great things about being at Berkeley is that the campus is just loaded with these phenomenal, highly ranked departments on, you know, really pretty much everything you can think about. Uh, but in particular, um, departments uh, that do work on issues related to the environment. And so there are a lot of courses across campus. Uh, and and um, the uh, law school will allow you to take at least a couple of those courses outside the law school. We actually pr provide a list of courses that we think are especially relevant, but it doesn't include everything. And finally, for those who are really interested, we have joint degree programs with urban planning, with an interdisciplinary department that works on energy and environmental issues, and also the public policy schools here at Berkeley. And I guess I was a little surprised to find out about this, but also with the JFK School uh, at uh, pub of Public Policy at Harvard. So I think that's a kind of whirlwind tour of the curriculum. So I, I think that uh, Ethan was next to talk a little bit more about our research program, which he's been a pillar of uh, for, um, you know, the, the uh, whole time that he's been here at Berkeley. So let me turn it back to him and then I think Erida is next. Yes, thank you, Professor Farber. Uh, I think you covered two of the main aspects of uh, the programming really well in terms of the curriculum and the clinic uh, more generally, but I did want to just say a few additional words about the, uh, the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment. And again, just remind all of you that if, if you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A uh, function now, and, and if necessary or relevant, we could take it uh, as we're speaking or uh, at the end of the session. Either way is fine. Uh, but so the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment is basically the law school's in-house research center. Some might call it a think tank. It, it functions in some ways almost like a nonprofit organization in the, uh, in the sense that we do a lot of research on cutting edge environmental and energy topics and uh, are often working with a diverse array of stakeholders. So policymakers, advocates, 
industry, uh, members of the public, uh, to really bring folks together to advance solutions to some of the key challenges that we face in the environmental and energy uh, sphere. And uh, we typically will release policy reports and do research to inform policy solutions. We'll also hold events uh, conferences, things like that, uh, and some student programming as well, uh, and help really sort of serve as a hub for the uh, environmental law program at the law school. Uh, specifically on the research, we have uh, four programs. So we have the oceans program, we have uh, a land use program, uh, and then we have a uh, water program and a climate and slash energy program. Uh, as I mentioned, I direct the, the climate program and now overseeing uh, the temporarily, the, the, all, all the different programs. Uh, but the work is, is very diverse and broad. And I think one of the advantages for students is that there are opportunities for students to get engaged in our research. So we frequently will uh, put out calls for uh, law students and sometimes other students across campus as well to work on some of our projects, sometimes for pay, sometimes for credit. Uh, and if you want to get a sense of the work that we do, you can go to our website. It's clee.berkeley.edu. Uh, and you can also see for, uh, for students, you can see some of the current research projects that we have available. Uh, but I can tell you from the climate uh, side of things, we do a lot of work on renewable energy, energy storage, electric vehicles, uh, we've been doing more work on uh, direct air capture of, uh, of carbon to try to sequester carbon. I know on the oceans program, they're, they're doing a lot on offshore wind energy as an emerging issue. On the land use side, we've done a lot on housing uh, along the lines of what Professor Farber was talking about with things like zoning, uh, but also things like how to use uh, open space uh, agricultural land for carbon sequestration. Uh, and then on the water side, we've done a lot of work on droughts, uh, groundwater management, water rights, et cetera. So I definitely, I think for the student perspective, the advantage of being able to plug in on some of these research projects is really a huge one. And I think a, a second advantage of what CLE provides for uh, law students at the school is that we're also there as a conduit to what some of the job opportunities are out in the real world. Because we're out there working constantly with uh, folks in nonprofit and government and industry, you know, we know a lot of people in these uh, in these different uh, entities, and we also can give some advice on where it might be a, what might be a good place to work given the students' interests. Um, so we're also available as a resource uh, in that respect. And then finally, I'll just mention that one of the things that CLE does also is help coordinate a lot of the, uh, the student groups and, uh, and, and is very student facing in the sense of putting on different events and helping to make sure that the budgets are met for the different student groups, um, including organizing, for example, a banquet annually, which we had to put on hold because of COVID, uh, but are going to be able to do that again uh, this coming spring. So we're excited about that. But on the topic of students, I wanted to uh, introduce to all of you uh, one of our um, our most valued students, of course, we value all students, but uh, Erida Tosini Correa, uh, very excited that you can be on the uh, webinar today to provide a student perspective on the different uh, activities available for law students here at Berkeley Law. So Erida, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, so I came um, into law school very clear that I wanted to do environmental law and pursue the environmental law certificate. And that's um, partially why I chose Berkeley to have like kind of a set curriculum that was going to like, you know, teach me what I needed to learn it was definitely very motivating, but also the, um, uh, extracurricular activity. So I think something that's unique to, oh, that being said, even though I was very interested in environmental law, I mean, I thought myself as unique, but when I came here, I didn't. I had a very like land use focus on, on environmental law. So it wasn't specifically like energy law or climate change law, but I, I was a tenant counselor before law school. And so um, I was interested in the intersection of like environmental law, housing um, and land use. And um, one of the things that was great is when um, as a 1L, you have the opportunity to join SLIPs. And one of the SLIPs that I was able, uh, these are student initiatives Appreciated, um, legal service projects. And one of the slips that I um, joined was ECO. And that um, is a great project because there's the environmental law clinic, but you're not able to do clinic until you're a 2L or 3L. And ECO was one of the ways that I got a peek of like what environmental law work look like, but I was also able to do another slip that was like not directly related to environmental law and kind of continue to pursue um, environmental 
law things um, while also pursuing like other legal interests that I had. Um, and you're also able to join journal student journals. So um, ELQ is I'm, I'm not um, a part of ELQ, but uh, a lot of my uh, friends that are pursuing environmental law um, or are just interested are involved in ELQ and you can get involved as a 1L and it's a great way to learn kind of like you hear a lot about journals, but I think it before you're in law school, you're like what what is this? And it's a great way, um, joining a journal is a great way of learning more about kind of like legal academia, like what uh, people in legal scholars in the field are in, you know, interested in in environmental law. Um, and then there's another slip that's a recent slip um, that was started um, was, is called like radical real estate. And that's also was started by people who are interested in environmental law and also at the intersection of environmental law and land use. And so I feel like these are examples of ways that um, both people who are like, who come in, they're like, I know environmental law is what I wanna do, or folks who are like, environmental law sounds interesting, are able to um, get involved. Uh, there's also another student group um, called SIEGE, Students for Economic, uh, Environmental and Economic Justice, which is also at the intersection of environmental law and other social policy. Um, and I think also one of the things that we have done as like, um, as students in, you know, in interested environment is like work with the faculty to be like, how can we diversify like course offerings? How can we, you know, diversify, you know, lectures and, and whatnot. So that's also been something that um, CLE staff has welcomed and welcomed input on, um, on student groups. And so for me, it's been great. I'm pursuing, like I said, I'm pursuing my, um, environmental law certificate so I've taken like very traditional environmental law classes but I've also like supplemented my experience and I've done the tenants uh, rights clinic um, for two semesters and so that's very different than environmental law but for me it's been like a really great way to like be at the you know intersect my interests and then at the same time I also was a research assistant for Professor Beaver who has uh, been doing research on like housing and land use. And so like that was an opportunity that I was also, and I just emailed Professor Bieber like as a 1L in the spring and I was just like, can I do research for you? Um, but the, and he was like, yeah, and um, found a way to make it interesting. And then there's, yeah. And my, I have had friends who are also in this program who have a very different experience than I am in terms of like the things that they're the environmental um, law classes and the way that they've pursued experiences so it it really is a a lot of different opportunities and you can make it what you want it to be great well thank you Arita for that uh, and again any questions feel free to use the Q&A function I see some questions have already come in a couple that I think would be well suited for uh, Professor Farber. So uh, first question is, is there an overlap between CLE and the Energy and Resources Group or ERG uh, at Berkeley? So Professor Farber. Uh, yeah, so there's not a, a formal institutional overlap, but there are some strong connections. Uh, I actually was the chair of ERG for four years uh, a little while ago. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely connected over there. And Dan Kamen, who's the current chair, has also been involved in some of our research projects. Uh, and finally, that we have a joint degree program with ERG uh, that we've had several students over the years uh, get uh, both uh, uh, masters from ERG and a JD uh, at the same time. So, so there are there are there are threads connecting us, but there's no uh, like official treaty between CLE and ERG that sets up a formal relationship. And I, I would just add from CLE perspective, and I think Professor Farber mentioned this, that just the, the resources and the knowledge across campus are, are one of the, to me, one of the prime benefits of being at UC Berkeley. And oftentimes in our research projects, we're collaborating with uh, the different departments around, uh, around the school, including ERG, but also the Haas Energy Institute at the business school, uh, the Turner Center on Housing Innovation, for example, on land use, um, the, the Center on, uh, on green, the green Economy and Labor, so looking at labor impacts around different climate policies. So um, it's definitely one of the hallmarks here that we can uh, have a multidisciplinary approach across campus. Uh, so another question for uh, Professor Farber specifically about uh, LLMs, asking if uh, the courses that uh, 
were explained and offered or described are also available for LLM students. Uh, so uh, LLMs are entitled to enroll in pretty much any uh, any course at the law school except the first year required courses where we tend to have uh, seating capacity issues. Um, and so definitely eligible to enroll in these. We actually have a separate set of certificate requirements for LLM students because uh, we want to make sure that the LLM students are only here for a year. And uh, so we want to make sure that the requirements track what's available to them in any given year. Uh, we tend to offer the same cluster of courses all the time, but there are some courses that, you know, in a given year might be skipped. Uh, and we want to make sure that the LLMs aren't uh, shortchanged as a result of that. All right, and a question uh, for Arida uh, about uh, whether or not you are doing any other uh, certificates while at Berkeley Law. So maybe an opportunity to talk about, you know, some of the other certificate opportunities that might, might fit in if there are others um, with the Environmental Energy Program. Yeah, so there's an energy law certificate and I, it's not going to be, I believe there's one more um, certificate. I think um, the, I'm, so I'm not doing any other certificates. I'm just doing the environmental law certificate. I think you can also do them like together. I do want to say the thing about a certificate is that um, you do have to take a bunch of required classes for that. And that can limit like your classes if you are interested in also doing clinic or if you're interested in also doing an externship and so for me, it was really important because this is like what I want to pursue. And I think um, I want, you know, employers to know that I'm like well-versed in environmental law and that I have had practice, um, but it is not something that is like critical. You can take environmental law classes without pursuing your certificate. Um, you can, you know, take the classes that you're just interested in. But I also think that it is, um, yeah, that wasn't your direct question, but I think you need to balance out, like see how much of the map out your time over four years and see how much the certificate is going to take because you're one L right you're taking all the classes that you need to take um, as one L which are not you have less requirements than I did but at the same time like property you have to take property as a if you want to get your certificate and that's no longer a requirement um, of graduation and so you want to balance those two things out great and I've got a uh, specific question here for Clee uh, about our oceans program. So, um, on your rights, I work with an offshore wind developer on the East Coast. I'm interested in returning to the field after law school. Can you share more about the research that we're doing in offshore wind and how a student can get involved? So our offshore wind work, this may not be relevant to everyone, but for those of you interested in offshore wind, it's really limited to California's offshore wind potential. We're not doing East Coast offshore wind as of yet, uh, although we're certainly trying to incorporate lessons from East Coast offshore wind into the California context. Most of our work though right now is about stakeholder convenings, supporting uh, California energy agencies as they're trying to find a way to see if it's even viable to get offshore wind going in California. Uh, those of you maybe may know that we don't have, we have uh, a very deep uh, sea floor off, off the coast of California compared to the East Coast. So we have to actually attach the wind turbines by cables. So there'll be floating wind turbines, which is Another question mark, but anyways, probably more information than anyone wanted on offshore wind, but hopefully that answers the question. Uh, a couple uh, curriculum questions that have come in. Um, one about uh, the Native American, uh, perhaps tribal law type uh, courses that might be available for students interested in Native American issues, as well as a uh, question around uh, administrative law offerings. So uh, maybe a, a question for Professor Farber, if you haven't already addressed those uh, by typing. Uh, well, I did put something on the Q&A about the Indian law question, uh, mostly saying that I, uh, I'm aware that there's been um, uh, opportunities for students in this area, but I'm not really aware of the details right now. I have uh, had students contact me, for example, about papers they were writing about these issues dealing with the overlap between Indian law and environmental law. I think Professor Bieber has also been involved in that because uh, for a short period of time when we were between Indian law teachers, um, his experts, uh, uh, he stepped in to cover the course while we were uh, waiting to uh, get new people on board. We're also actually in the process of attempting to hire 
uh, a, another faculty member in Indian law besides uh, uh, our current faculty. Um, um, and we have an offer outstanding, but we're, we're not, you know, we have to wait and find out if we're able to attract the person here. Um, on administrative law, I think we have some terrific administrative law professors here. Uh, we have very high enrollment in those courses. Uh, uh, so um, we've only had a limited opportunity to offer advanced uh, seminars specifically in administrative law, but of course, administrative law cuts across many different areas of the curriculum, and so those issues are, are really kind of pervasive um, in a number of different courses. It's a great question. I mean, administrative law in some ways is really an essential course to take if you want to work on almost any aspect of environmental law. I mean, at CLE, we don't practice uh, law, but we're constantly working with agencies and have to understand the restrictions on what agencies can do, how they operate, because regulatory rulemaking agency actions are such a critical part of not really the bulk of, of how we do environmental law, uh, at least in the United States, and certainly in California. Uh, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, a couple questions sort of about the clinical program. So I'll see if I can bundle them. The first one is pretty specific. Well, actually, they're both fairly specific. One is asking if um, there's been any advocacy at CLE uh, around the proposed development at People's Park. Uh, some of you attending here may not know what People's Park is, but it's, uh, it's basically a public park located right near campus. Uh, has a long history as part of the free speech movement. Uh, a lot of unhoused people. Uh, live there now, and there's development proposals that have been controversial, including a, a recent one that I believe is going forward uh, to turn at least some of it into housing. Um, we are not directly engaged uh, at CLE. We don't tend to get involved at that, that kind of granular level around projects. Specifically, we're more about policy action. Uh, however, this is why I think it ties into the clinic. The clinic will take on you know, specific uh, clients and, and litigation. Um, and so there's another question there around um, let's see if I can find it here around low income uh, ratepayer advocacy, I believe was the question uh, and how to get involved in um, yeah, advocacy for low income utility customers. This is again, kind of the, the kind of thing that the, the clinic might take on. I mean, you know, the clinic doesn't really necessarily know, I don't want to speak for our clinic director, uh, but you know, they often don't necessarily know what they're going to be working on at any particular point in time. It's kind of what's available, uh, what feels like a good fit. Um, but, uh, but I would, recommend looking at some of the projects that the clinic has been engaged in um, because this is a kind of thing that they, they are focused on a lot of equity related uh, environmental justice projects uh, in particular. And I don't know uh, if Professor Farber or Ariel want to add to that about the clinic, but that would be my, my response on that. Uh, no, I think, I, I, I think that was a great response. I don't have anything. Okay, um, great. So let's see some other questions here. A lot of good ones coming in. Um, I, that's one question. I'm very much interested in environmental law, but do not have a science or environmental background and worried I may not know enough. Uh, with all that there is to learn in the field, you find students from liberal arts backgrounds do well in this field. Any advice for closing this knowledge gap? And uh, Erida, maybe we could direct that one first to you. I'm curious, if, you know, as a, as a current student, if you have perspectives on what, what background is helpful uh, for, for environmental law courses. Um, I don't think, so I have a, not a science background, but I did uh, major in sustainable development. So I've been interested in kind of sustainability and taking environmental law classes um, in undergrad, but I am certainly not like a hard sciences person. I think, um, I don't think that it's critical. I think you can excel at the end of the day, you know, these are law classes. And so it's still going to be like, writing and reading. That being said, I do think having like a technical background could help you in the uh, field that you want to specialize in, but that, techni that technical background can come from job experience. If you've like worked in a certain industry um, uh, or volunteer experience um, and it can give you kind of a different perspective, but I don't think that that's going to affect your ability into performing class. Um, I like your grades are not going to be affected as to whether you have a hard science background. It might just be that you need to take classes to figure out like what area you're interested in. Professor Farber, do you want to weigh in on you know background and relevant knowledge for students coming into the program? Yeah, we I mean we do benefit from having students who come here with um, sometimes work experience, sometimes educational background on you know issues relating to the environment. 
Uh, and it's great. They bring something, uh, I think, uh, extra to class. Uh, I think sometimes uh, students who don't have that background are a little bit intimidated, but, uh, you know, and are afraid uh, that they won't be able to, you know, really uh, work in the area. But, uh, you know, this really is law, not, you know, not chemistry or uh, atmospheric science or whatever, electrical engineering. And while it never hurts to have extra background, you know, what, what uh, really matters is really just a commitment to the uh, issues um, and, you know, legal, legal skills and ability. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of, uh, of the, you know, sort of top environmental lawyers around didn't have that kind of technical background. And they, you know, they were history majors or political science majors, or, um, you know, I, I don't usually admit this, but I was a philosophy major. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it makes me sound a little bit too ivory tower and I'm already pretty ivory tower to begin with. So I think people can come in with all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, and you can also learn, you know, for example, by doing a field placement and working with people who work on, I don't know, water pollution issues or uh, uh, air pollution issues or whatever, um, a lot about the sort of technical aspects that might be helpful later on. And I. I have to mention, Professor Farber actually works in a tower, uh, his office is in a tower. <laughs> um, but not exactly but, ivory, but you know. Definitely not ivory. We're just glad it's seismically safe. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's the main thing. Um, but, uh, and I would just add on that, um, that you know, no one person has a monopoly on all the skills and background knowledge that's needed for many environmental issues. I mean, at least on the issues that we work on at CLE, for example, around clean technology, you know, we need people who understand the science of and chemistry of batteries, uh, the engineering of how to construct things, how to finance it, come out of that project finance world, uh, obviously understand the law, have a you know, communications background. I mean, it takes all types. So no one person is going to have, you know, a monopoly on, uh, on all the different skills that are required for many of our, you know, really most intractable and challenging uh, environmental and energy um, uh, challenges that we have to address. So I would just say that. Um, and then a question here uh, for Arida. Uh, it's an interesting one. I like this one. I was wondering if you could speak to the collaborative nature of environmental law students at Berkeley. Is there a strong sense of community among environmental law students and do you work on projects with other students often? I think um, that Berkeley in and of itself is an extremely collaborative law school. I think um, that's part of one of the reasons that I chose Berkeley and it has panned out. Um, Berkeley is one of the elite, nice law schools. Uh, people are kind here. And I think that that's true uh, across all of the, um, you know, interest or practice areas, interest areas. Um, and so I think that that carries into the like environmental um, law space. I think um, you have, you sh like anything, you should find your people. Um, and so that means, is it going to be in the slip and you're going to like be in community and do collaborative projects with the people in your slip? Is it going to be um, in the journal, I mean, ELQ is one of the most popular journals, um, it's one of the most social journals at Berkeley, um, and, you know, people are very active, and, or is it going to be across, you know, in your classes? I know that for me, in pretty much all of my environmental law classes, I, in every single one that I've taken for my certificate, I have created an outline with a group of people, like I have worked with a group of people um, when, I, with my research assistant position, it was more like independent. Um, that being said, again, like I have been able to kind of turn to other students. Um, I, it's not super active, but I kind of try to start like a group chat with other women of color pursuing um, environmental law um, to kind of form community then. And we were active on the group chat for a while. That, to show you as an example of just like different ways that people, um, you know, build community in the in the environmental law um, sector. So I would say definitely yes. Great. 
Uh, well, it's great that we have you here to provide that really on the ground uh, perspective. Uh, so I want to answer a, a couple questions I think are sort of related questions around the subject matters that uh, that CLE and also by extension the curriculum uh, might address. Uh, the first is international environmental law. If there's opportunities to do work on that through either CLE or uh, the clinic. Um, and I would just say from a CLE perspective, uh, a lot of our projects tend to be California focused because California is doing a lot of work and cutting edge work uh, on environmental and water energy topics. Uh, but that said, we do do some international uh, topics as well. I think our oceans program in particular uh, covers a lot of international law uh, questions. And even on the climate side, we've, we've, we've done that as well. I know at the research at the clinic, uh, we have done some projects looking at uh, ways that other subnational jurisdictions, subnational meaning like a city or a state like California, uh, around the world could potentially reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So we looked at, you know, provinces in China and and Thailand and uh, you know different parts of uh, provinces in Nigeria, UK. So we we did some of that, or at least one clinical offering. I don't currently know what the clinic is uh, has on tap in terms of an uh, international law, but um, but occasionally those projects will come up. Uh, and then the other question was around environmental justice and whether or not CLE is working on uh, addressing environmental justice issues. And I would say that's very much embedded in, in most, if not all, of the research that we're doing at CLE. Um, so, for example, we're looking at ways that lower income communities can have access to electric vehicles. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work on uh, how low income uh, residents can uh, access financing to do energy retrofits. Uh, we'll also address environmental justice concerns when it comes to siting some of the facilities that we need to decarbonize. Uh, so just a few examples there. But I wanted to uh, let Professor Farber weigh in just from a, a curriculum standpoint, uh, what the offerings might be uh, on or how they might touch on environmental justice and, and international law. Um, so on international uh, law, we do have uh, a course that's offered every year on international environmental law. Uh, we don't really, um, we have a, a, a very strong inter international law program. We don't really go uh, in, in terms of the curriculum in that much depth into international environmental law um, as a specific field. Um, although obviously um, in the area of climate change, you really can't draw a line between what's happening right now in Glasgow and the Paris Agreement and so forth, and what's you know happening domestically in U.S. states or in uh, Washington. Um, in terms of climate justice, that's kind of a work in progress. We've had a course on climate justice ever since uh, I came uh, to Berkeley, which was, uh, I don't know, almost 20 years ago now. Uh, and um, we're trying to expand our curriculum in that area. We had a working group, uh, uh, all, you know, basically all through last spring uh, and into the summer. Uh, trying to address environmental justice issues and think about how CLE can do more. Uh, and we have come up with some recommendations uh, in, in terms of curriculum as well as other things. And we're, you know, we recommendations are easy, so we're trying to implement them uh, now. Uh, but that's, as I said, still a work in progress. Great. Thank you, Professor Farber. And I've got uh, a couple more that I think you might be uh, equipped to address. So uh, first question is, uh, are there courses related to policy making in the energy field? So we don't teach uh, uh, we don't teach courses that are purely public policy courses, uh, or at least you know that's that's not the aim. Um, but um, we do have a strong policy component to a number of the courses, including the uh, energy law based you know introductory course and the renewable energy course. Uh, so, you know, climate, you know, we don't, climate policy is kind of integrated into the curriculum. And as I said, there's also the opportunity to take courses uh, uh, at the policy school or at ERG or elsewhere dealing, um, you know, sort of more fully with the policy issues. And actually on that last point, another question about uh, examples of where law students in the environmental law program can work with other colleges on campus. And if there's uh, any involvement with the hard science departments? So maybe Professor Farber and then Eric, if you wanted to weigh in as well afterwards. So uh, we don't really, um, you know, we don't really have direct input into like law students who are looking for, I don't know, you know, research assistant opportunities or something elsewhere on campus. 
uh, you know, that doesn't really go through us. Uh, um, I, and I would, I would think that probably in the hard sciences, they're probably looking for, you know, uh, PhD students in their own field uh, for research. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, however, if at least some of our uh, students are involved in um, a department at the College of Natural Resources uh, with the very unwieldy name of environmental science policy and management, um, um, because the you know the courses over there and the research projects over there are often you know sort of have a legal component where law students could be, I, I think, directly useful. Yeah, and Eric, I just wanted to direct it to you, just if, if you had any experience, you know, or or if any of your you know fellow law students have experience working off campus that you you might want to share or highlight. Um, I don't have um, I don't have experience in this area. I think I I feel like what Professor Farber said. I think people really make this program what they want. So I think if you're looking for something, I feel like it exists and you can find it. Um, but I feel like um, a lot of my colleagues, I think, tend to be interested on the policy side. And so what they're looking for is kind of opportunities to blend that area of like law and policy rather than um, directly like work in hard sciences. All right, great. And I will take a couple of questions here that have some specifics about uh, what opportunities might be available uh, with governments and nonprofits. I think this is kind of, if I understand the question correctly, it's sort of an open-ended question about what are those type of jobs that students might get. Um, and I think Professor Farber and Erdita can, can weigh in on this as well. But, you know, in terms of the jobs that we know of and work with, uh, CLE, I mean, I kind of break it down into three main sectors. You have uh, jobs in, uh, in government, and so that could mean local level, state, federal level, working at agencies, uh, potentially working in Department of, Department of Justice, whether it's federal or the Attorney General's office, uh, State Department of Justice here in California. Uh, all of them are involved in environmental uh, permitting and lawsuits uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so that's sort of the government bucket. And then there's the nonprofit bucket uh, where you have uh, recent grads working on sometimes policy, but sometimes litigation at various environmental nonprofits. So some of the big ones would be Sierra Club or Natural Resources Defense Council, Earth Justice, um, again, litigation or policy advocacy, sometimes research. Uh, and then the last one I would say is industry. I mean, obviously law firms, uh, small, medium, large, uh, that have uh, clients that need assistance with, uh, you know, environmental compliance uh, or are, you know, let's say an electric vehicle company or solar company. And then there's also the, the non-law firm industry side, you know, going in-house um, at, at an energy company, for example, or a utility. Um, so those, that's kind of how I see it. There's also a bit of a separate bucket of, uh, of going into academia, maybe clerkships as part of that. Um, but uh, maybe less representative of what most students would go into. But uh, Professor Farber or Arida, if you wanted to add to that, feel free. Uh, sure. You know, I think one of the great advantages we have is just the fact that we're at ground zero for climate policy, uh, certainly in the U.S. and, and in some ways globally. Uh, you know, we're at least, I don't know, 10, 15 years ahead of the U.S. on climate policy. Uh, and I don't ever think the country as a whole is going to catch up. I think they're, you know, we're going to be blazing the trail. They're going to be coming up from behind because after all, you know, they have to deal with um, very different political terrain and a very different uh, judicial terrain than we have to deal with uh, in California. And part one consequence of that is that uh, governments in California are dealing with these very cutting edge issues. Uh, the, uh, many of the uh, major national environmental groups have offices or even headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, you know, this is really kind of the place to be uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I think um, uh, I think that's a real draw. Um, I noticed that there was a question about community among students that I think Arida was obviously is the best suited to answer, but I just want to say. I, you know, have thought since I came here that that was one of the really unique things about Berkeley. Uh, we actually did a sort of survey of other uh, law school programs back when I came to see what we were doing, what other schools were doing, what our strengths were. And uh, it was clear that one of the big strengths was a sense of community and energy among students 
of that really would be very hard to duplicate anywhere else. And I, uh, Andrew, I want to let you weigh in. I just would add that um, that there's a, another question about international job opportunities as well. Um, so I, I think at least a lot of my answer on that first question, I think would also apply for international students, but maybe just, you know, in an international context. So I just wanted to address that question too. And then Erida, go ahead and, and uh, feel free to weigh in. Yeah, I think job opportunities, I think, I mean, I would just reiterate, like you can pursue, you can pursue environmental law at the law school um, and go into every sector, uh, nonprofit, government, um, uh, private sector. I'll be going into the private sector, which is really weird for me because I have only worked in nonprofits in the public sector prior to law school. And everyone, I'll say this, okay. People who want to come in and are like, I want to do um, public interest. People always say like, you're going to get like sucked in and you're going to have to go to a firm. I will say that I actually think, I will say that one of the things that I actually think is really cool about students in CLE is that I have seen that all the students that came in that are were like, I want to go to a nonprofit organization. I want to go into government have really stuck to that and really pursue that. And I think the opportunities are there. And I actually don't feel like even I've seen that pressure in like other sectors of the law school. I actually feel like the students who are interested in environmental law really suck. I actually wanted to pursue the private sector because I thought it would be a change in terms of my experience. Um, but I was worried about like, how could I pursue environmental law um, in the private sector? I feel like I have found, I mean, I haven't started. I feel like I have found a firm that does a lot of uh, regulatory work and I'll be working hopefully on transportation regulatory working on electric vehicle regulatory work and stuff in DC so that's going to be pretty cool um I will also say that there's a lot of opportunities during the law school where you can extern like during a semester at different uh nonprofits and so people extern at NRDC at Earth Justice at um like all Sierra Club like <laughs> you know, big names of environmental law. I also have friends who are pursuing plaintiff side environmental law, and that's what they did um, in the summer, which is like something that I didn't know about. Uh, I didn't know that that was a thing. And so they're, they're really um, great opportunities. Also in terms of international, this is not for, I don't know, international students particularly, but in terms of international opportunities for students, um, Berkeley has like a UN program and um, where you work with, um, uh, I don't know the details of the program, but you work with, uh, you're assigned to like a country and you work with them as their, uh, you know, legal advisor um, at the UN. And while that, that is not directly environmentally related, I have known students who did that and like they were assigned to like a small island nation to be their environment, uh, to be their legal counsel. And so all the small island nation cares about is rising sea levels and climate change and so like all of what they did was like climate policy at the UN level um at the UN for a semester in law school which I thought was pretty awesome great so I think we have time for just one more question which is fitting because I think there's only one more question to answer here of, of all these uh, great ones that have come in and the question is how do you see if at all Berkeley's offerings and role in this area changing as climate change progresses I think that's a great question a good one to end on uh, I uh, I would just say from a uh, perspective at CLE is that this is kind of what makes the job interesting and fun I mean it's depressing to work on climate change in a lot of ways but it's also really rewarding and especially because the issues are constantly evolving and as we make progress in some areas like in California we're making great progress on renewables electric vehicles now there's always going to be the next sort of suite of, of technologies and challenges that we have to help pioneer and advance so right now I would say that's things like engineered carbon removal, where we're figuring out mechanical ways to capture carbon uh, and try to uh, hopefully slow uh, the advance of climate change that way. That's a very emerging technology. There's some others like hydrogen, for example, produced from renewable energy, uh, how to electrify buildings and get them off of natural gas using technologies like heat pumps. So that we, we need to constantly kind of reinvent ourselves in a positive way because the challenges, you know, keep progressing as we address some of them, we have additional ones to solve. Um, so that's from a sort of a research climate perspective, but uh, I want to let uh, Professor Farber weigh in on uh, in terms of course offerings and how, how we adapt to the changing conditions in the world. Yeah, well, I think one area clearly has been energy, which was not a big part of the environmental picture 
uh, I don't know, I think it really only started um, uh, after the turn of the century. Um, and we've now developed this very rich curriculum. I think in terms of climate change adaptation, you know, the water course is going to be increasingly about how to deal with floods and drought as those become more intense. Uh, and that will happen uh, in land, the land use course will also have a lot of emphasis on adaptation issues. Uh, I actually have uh, sometimes taught a course on disaster law, um, which uh, I'm afraid to say is going to become a lot more relevant going forward, uh, just because of the effects that we expect from climate change. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we had some kind of regular offering on geoengineering, carbon removal, and you know the sort of more out there uh, kinds of solar management solutions. Uh, because as things get worse, you know we're going to have to explore a broad range of possible uh, responses. Yeah, and actually, I know another example of this is a wildfire class. You know, that's probably not something we would have taught, you know, even just a few years ago. Uh, well, every day I want to give you just the last word. I know we just got about a minute left. So any final thoughts you wanted to share? Um, just, I think if you're interested in environmental law and you want to go to a nice law school, you should come to Berkeley. <laughs> We're here. Uh, all right, that's a great, uh, great way to end it. Uh, Chelsea, give it back to you uh, for any, any closing comments here. Yeah, uh, no, I had no closing comments other than to thank everybody so much for attending this afternoon. And uh, thank you to all of the speakers who are presenting today. Um, we hope to see all of your applications soon. And if you have any questions about the process, you're more than welcome to reach out to the admissions office. Have a great rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye.